Church, say amen. amen. Well, can we give God praise this morning in the sanctuary? Can we give God a hand clap of praise this morning for this? I know it's went outside, but today is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad as we prepare for morning worship experience and receive our clergy this morning. Holy, holy, holy.
that you have made and, and you have included us in it. And along with the new mercies and your grace, all of which is abundantly embracing us, we want you to know, Lord, that we love you. We adore you and magnify your name. We honor you and we petition you to hear our prayers as we invoke your presence in our house of worship. Our prayer is a petition to hear not only our plea for wisdom, but understanding that in your presence is goodness and joy, giving and forgiveness of sin, and there is peace that passes all understanding. Invoking your presence is the assurance of our godly endeavor, our labors, our witnessing, our gathering in your house to pray together, Sing together, hear your word imparted to us, to be edified, to be built up, to be sent home better than we came. Fill us, gracious God. Let us know that you indeed love us, pouring your knowledge into our lives that only you can do. God, be with us. We are willing vessels today. Make us loving advocates of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for him and for being in our lives and for blessing each one of us today abundantly. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen, Jesus. Let the church say amen.
good monumental power to the end visitors. I see some of them. With the Spirit of the Lord, it's here at the One True Church, Apostolic and Universal, the Holy Faith is my brotherly and sincerely declared the Apostle's Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From which he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His grace and his mercy will endure forever. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal God, we bow down this day. Give the opportunity to give you the glory, to give you the honor, and to give you the praise. First and foremost, Father God, we thank you not for that which you've done, but for who you are. In and of yourself, we thank you, Lord, that you take the choice to choose us to be your servants. In the midst of the darkness, Lord, of which we reside, there's still light. There's still light. In spite of what we hear, in spite of what we see, we that believe know you're still in charge. In all things, all things will work to the good for those who only believe. Thank you for encouraging us, God. Help us to go forward, coming out of this institute, coming out of this ordination yesterday. Help us to go forward with the word you gave about the church and the community. For God, we may not understand completely, but the community is the church. It's not inside these walls. It's wherever we stand. Because wherever we go, you are with us. We ought to have an impact on everything around us. When we who believe walk into a room, the presence is there of the Lord. Yes, we must take that opportunity to rise up just like the adversary does and proclaim the gospel. God, we thank you so much because you've done so much for us. You've done more than we deserve, God. You've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And we thank you. But at the same time, to whom much is given, much is required. Encourage us, strengthen us, touch us. Bind us together, Lord, that we can have that impact that you would have us to make. And individually, God, some struggle. We struggle. We all struggle from different things. I need not call them out, Lord, but you know what they are. Touch our hearts. Touch our minds. Touch our spirits. That we may be available for you to use. Let us serve, but let us serve in joy. Let us serve in peace. As we go forward, God, today, somebody, somebody needs a word. And today you've chosen one, Lord. And we say thank you. I know not what the word's going to be, but I know who does. And I'm thankful for that. It could have been anybody, God, but it's not. It's the one you've chosen. I pray for him. That he have that anointing, that power, and that unction that only you can give to allow your word to come forth through him in spirit and in truth. And God, before I get up off my knees, bless this church family. And I don't mean just the Metropolitan Church family, Lord, because the Amy Zion Church is the next year. And today, Metropolitan reaps those benefits of being a connection with church. And we are so thankful that you've allowed us this opportunity to hear from you. As we go forth in this worship service, Lord, have your way. In whatever format it may be, have your way. And when you have that way, God, we'll be sure to give you the praise the honor and the glory. 
In Jesus' name, all of God's people said amen. 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 Saturday is canceled. Uh, of course, we are we 
miss having Sunday school on Saturday, but because of the late council program, uh, we'll go ahead and cancel that so that those who uh, do want to be a part of the late council honoree can certainly do that. This afternoon, it looks like, we've got a birthday celebration going on here. Uh, and I do see our honoree for the birthday celebration in the house. And so we'll be honoring uh, our very own Honorable Thurman Milner, who is there in the back. Church and 
and I'm there, I met some amazing people who connected with us, and that was a nurturing church for Nicole and I, because that's the church we got engaged at, and that church really blessed us and nurtured us and really loved on us, and it was at that congregation that we really saw how cultural shifts can happen. And through our relationship, God birthed the ministry and brought people from all walks of life and races and creeds. And it was there at, 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 at Rock Hill. And Ms. Linda Smith served as our preacher steward there. And she was the preacher. And I always say we can treat people nice. That's the important. Treat people nice because you just never know. And I want to thank God for the relationship because it really does matter. Because some people don't want to have anything to do with you. But isn't it a blessing whenever you can be gone for six years and you can still connect and, and relationships and family. So we're so happy to have you all this morning to be with us here at Metropolitan and especially to all of our visitors. Listen, you could have gone anywhere else. It's raining outside. In fact, you could have stayed in your bed, <laughs> tuned in to church this morning, but you came and you pressed your way, and we certainly are happy to have you. And because of that, Metropolitan, let's just take a few minutes and just get around and get up and greet and welcome and just love on people because that's what we are. We're living and loving how? To make what? Somebody stay. So let's get up. Let's go preach somebody we didn't come to church with this morning. And of course, it's good to see Brother Milner in church this morning. We'll celebrate him at 1 o'clock. We're so happy to have you. Come on, let's get up and let's go find somebody. Amen. Give them give some love this morning. Give them some love.
ministry this morning, and we see Reverend Valerie in making this virtue with us this morning. As we were going through transition, she was here also helping this church in the season of transition of pastoral leadership. So we do thank God for her presence here today. And we see our, 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 our New England Conference president, I think your sister's with me, amen, and our New England Conference president, Sister Carolyn Humphrey, is glad to have you and Lake Council this morning with us. Um, during, uh, it was, we just finished a series, wrapped up a series of Know Your Church, um, and on, for, on the first Sunday, we will be able to receive our three newest members in the full connection, Sister Sydney, they already working already, Sister Sydney, Sister April, and Brother Brooks, amen, so next Sunday, we'll welcome them in the full connection in the church, but we decided that we'll just open it up to the entire congregation to go through that, that, that season or that series. And so I asked the question during on uh, Wednesday night, I said, you know, what are the first five books of the Bible? I just wanted to know what was the first five books of the Bible. And uh, we went down, and then somebody just kept going. <laughs> got to number 10, I was like, kept on going. And would you know that Sister Agnes Moore books of the Bible, didn't have no, didn't have no, no cheat sheet in front of her, she just went straight down the line. And so this morning, I want to, I want to just honor you and bless you. You, 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 you bless me, you encourage me, I said, man, let me go tighten up a little bit and try to get my books of the Bible. So if she just come to one of my oldest members here at the house of worship, and we just want to honor you and just love on you for just who you are. And you know, that's the belief that I do believe, that people still can inspire you. Regardless of the age, that's one of the reason why we're doing this book study. In fact, one church, four generations. Because we all have to learn that we can actually do this ministry together. And we don't have to be separate and apart. So uh, we're always learning. And that's the blessing. We are always learning. And so she made us all look bad, including the pastor. I said, hey, come on now. So bless you, Sister Moore. And we love you. We love you. sense for him just to come to the institute home yesterday and then leave and head back to South Carolina. Because we believe if you're going to come to New England, you got to stop at Met. Amen. I just believe you just got to come to Met. There's no other place like it. And Dr. McLean has served the church and continuing and is continuing to serve the church. He served as the academic dean there at our college. We take pride of um, the Clinton College in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And we have some South Carolinians who are very proud of South Carolina. <laughs> and, uh, and the work that, yeah, we got some in here, amen. We have a, and the work that they've done at Clinton College and the ministry that they're birthing at Clinton College. Now he currently serves as the Dean of Online Learning. They have a program um, that uh, he was here to give certificates out to minister or to individuals who went through a course of study. And so, of course, he served as presiding elder in the South Carolina Conference, I think, of two presiding elder districts. He's married, he served in the military for 27 years, and that's what God called him to preach. He started churches in Korea, pastored in North Carolina, South Carolina. And this morning, we are so blessed to have he, him and his wife to be with us this morning. If you pray for the preacher, 
I believe he will preach. And I always believe that if you bring in the pew, there will always be power in the pulpit. So as he comes this morning, which, are you going to pray for him, right? You're going to pray. Because I think we must need a word from God this morning. <laughs>
praise to the angel that God has sent to this house. Reverend Samuel Blanks, First Lady, to all of these casual ministers of the gospel, and to all of you, God's people, and especially, cannot be this person now, if I do, I'll have to ride right on the tail of the plane. <laughs> In my life of 42 years. to 
know the love of Christ which, in, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Then he goes into verse 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I want you to think with me from these few verses from the subject, there is more. There is more. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this privilege, for this opportunity to stand and declare your holy word. Lord, I realize that I am nothing without you. I realize that I need your strength.
for the church. I'm, I'm praying for you, Metropolitan. I'm praying that you would be strengthened by God and fitted for the task of being a member of the body of Christ. So this morning, I, I, and let me just uh, preface this by saying that I understand that uh, a good Methodist preacher will give you three points and, and they will go to their seat. But I, I'm afraid I will not be giving you three points this morning. I, what I want to do is I want us to just walk through this prayer that Paul prays because I think it was so rich. It, it has so much. And I want to try uh, to unpack this prayer that Paul is praying for the church. In other words, this prayer is somewhat like a step ladder, somewhat like a, a prayer, I call it a prayer staircase that, that progresses upwards until Paul reaches this pinnacle of praise and he ends it with a doxology in this chapter. And so with each step that Paul is taking us, he is taking us higher and higher in our understanding of the fullness of God than what he has for his church. But the first step uh, Paul prays uh, in this uh, staircase or this stair ladder starts in verse 16 where Paul prays that the church would be strengthened internally through the Holy Spirit. In the previous chapters, Paul had been talking about suffering, and so I believe it is fitting that this is where he begins his prayer. In other words, it is our suffering, in our suffering, that we experience the strength of God working on our behalf. Now I know and I understand that, that no one wants to go through suffering. It's painful. It, 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 it doesn't feel good. It, we we want to get out of suffering as soon as we possibly can. However, we must realize that it is in the suffering that other people are able to see the power of God that is working in us. And so when you are going through, when you are suffering, and you keep your hand in God's hand, then people are able to look at you and wonder why you have not lost your mind. Why you are not going crazy, why you are not in a panic, why you are not discouraged. It is because the power of God is working on the inside of you working and allowing the wisdom of God and the strength of God and the power of God to keep you in perfect peace. When Christ was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was able to endure the suffering because of the power of God working on the inside of him. When he was hanging on the cross, suffering and agony, he was still able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do because of the power of God that was working on the inside of him. And my, my brothers and sisters, I come to let you know that you and I have that same power. Not just in times of suffering, but we also have that same power each and every day of our lives. But there's more. The second step that Paul takes in this ladder, he prays that believers may be dwelt and dwelt with Christ by faith. That's, that's verse 17, if you want to look at it. We all know and understand that when we are saved, Christ dwells on the inside of us. We all got that. But here Paul is taking this idea even further. He is praying that as you grow in Christ, that Christ will become stronger and stronger on the inside of you until it gets to the point where he controls every aspect of your life. Paul is praying that Christ will find in us a dwelling place that is in our hearts. We have to, he has become a permanent resident in our heart. He is praying that Christ, in other words, will settle down in our hearts and control our every thought and control our every action because Jesus, if the truth be told, really is the right arm. By faith, we must allow Christ to dwell in our hearts and always be in control of our life, not just some of the times. You know how some 
of us, we want to lay our religion down because we got something that we want to say to someone. And we know we can't do it because we have our religion. I don't know what I'm talking about. But he wants to dwell all the time. But there's more. Paul takes another step in this prayer line, and he says that believers may be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 17, Paul uses two metaphors to explain uh, this part of his prayer. The first is compared to a garden where flowers and shrubs are, are planted, and they are planted, uh, and they are flourishing. And the reason that they are flourishing is because they are firmly rooted and grounded in good soil. In this way, Paul is saying, I, I, I want you to be like a plant that is rooted and grounded in the love of God. In this situation, uh, our love, it seems that, that it is it's something that nourishes us and it keeps us strong so that we can handle whatever comes our way. The second metaphor that Paul uses is an architect, architectural metaphor. He compares a believer to a building that has been built on a solid foundation. And now, in other words, the love of God is a solid foundation that will not fail no matter what the circumstance. Whatever comes your way, it is the love of God that wraps around you that holds you and that keeps you no matter what the situation is, whatever you fear, God's love has you. Whatever it men might say or do to you, the love of God still will encompass you. God's love will carry you through whatever situation you have. And so Paul prays that we would be rooted and grounded in this unfailing love of God. But guess what? There's more. The fourth step in this matter, a, a, a prayer that Paul was praying, he said that believers would be able to grasp the fullness of Christ's love. In, in, in other words, it is not enough to be rooted and grounded in love, but here Paul is praying that we might somehow be able to comprehend the greatness of God's love. He is not talking about our love for Christ, so don't get it twisted because see, sometimes we can be up, sometimes we can be down, sometimes we can be over to the left, sometimes we can be to the right. So he is not talking about our love for Christ, but he's talking about God's love for us. Yeah. How can we comprehend this love? Because Paul says this kind of love surpasses knowledge. How can we grasp something that surpasses knowledge? God's love is unfailing. God's love is unending. God's love is unsearchable. God's love is unreachable. God's love reaches the highest mountain. God's love takes us to the lowest valley. Who can know the extent of God's love for us? Can we comprehend it? Although we, 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 we might never understand the extent of God's love for us, one thing that we can know is that His love is true yes. and His love is unfailing. Although we can never know the fullness of Christ's love, we can know that His love will never fail. God's love is not fake, it's not phony, it's, a, it's the real deal, and it's the same love that when Christ first saved us from our sin, that is how much he loves us, that he sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. It's unchangeable. It's unreachable. It's unstoppable. His love is unconditional. That means that no matter what you and I do, and you know we can mess up sometimes, no matter what you and I do, God's love is never going to change. I believe that Paul understood that we can never grasp the fullness of God's love in this age. But his prayer was that we would grow in our awareness of that love, especially when we go through hardships 
when we go through suffering and when we go through persecution. We may not understand it, but just know that the love of God is broad enough to encompass everything. It is long enough to last through all eternity. It is deep enough to reach uh, the most degraded sinner. It is high enough to exalt Jesus Christ in the heaven. The love of God will surely carry you through. But guess what? There's more. Paul takes another step in this ladder of his prayer as he prays. And, and, and he prays that believers might know this love that surpasses knowledge. Verse 19. It's, this seems like a repeat of what Paul had just previously stated and, 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 and talked about when he talked about love. In the previous part of the prayer, Paul is praying that, that they would grasp the full dimension of the love of Christ or that they might understand the fullness of of God's love. But here in this part of this prayer, Paul is praying that we will know the love of God. Y'all oh, missed that. That we will know the love of God in the full biblical sense of the word. In other words, now Paul wants us uh, not only to know the full dimensions of God's love, but he wants us to experience the love of Christ, which surpasses human knowledge. In other words, Paul wants us not only to know the love of God, but to experience the love of God to the fullest extent. What a powerful prayer uh, uh, that Paul was praying here for the saints. He is saying, I don't want you to just know God, I want you to experience God. You see, there's a difference between having a head knowledge of God and having a heart knowledge of God. And I believe that's what Paul is saying in that passage, is that we need to have a heart knowledge of God. We need to experience God. Listen, I don't know about you, but I, I, I want to experience the love of God. I don't want to just see God. I, just, I don't want to know what my mother or my daddy or my grandmama, I don't want to know their love of God, but I want to have experience of the love of God. I don't want to just see God as someone in a distance that's somewhere far away. I want to feel His presence. Every now and then. Listen, I would not serve a God that could not feel His presence. Every now and then. Something on the inside just makes you, lets you know that the love of God is so you. No matter Container is full, but 
guess what? There's much more water. You can, you can, you can dip again, but guess what? You have to put a dip in that, in that sea of water. You can dip it again, and you have not dipped. Put a dip in that. You can keep filling your cup until you can take all that you can take. But Paul says, guess what? There is more. If you take that picture, and your picture is empty, there is plenty to fill it again. And so you keep filling it over and over and over and over. And every time you come to the fountain, there is always plenty to drink of God. There is more. So, 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 so Paul is praying here that we would be filled. And then he was praying that we would be filled again. And then filled again. And then filled again over and over and over again. Not just in my, this life, but even in the life to come. And I believe that at this point, as Paul is writing this letter, he realizes that, that, that we can't get too much of God. And, and, and there's so much of this infinite God of ours that it would take this lifetime and, and the life to come. And so at this point, Paul has reached the pinnacle of this prayer. And as he, I, I can just imagine in my mind, as he is praying this prayer, and he had reached this point, he has taken us from suffering to victory. He has taken us from the depths of sin to the unending love of God, from the weakness of the flesh to the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is nothing left for him to do but step into this doxology. A doxology is simply another word for praise to God. And so Paul is saying, I, I have taken you to the top of this prayer ladder. And so now, let me just stop right there. Now, I have shown you the love of God. But now, I have prayed that you would be filled with the power of God. But now, that power, that's a powerful word, that word now. Because it transitions Paul into this time of praise. He says, now unto him. He is able to do exceedingly. I want you to praise these words. He says he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think according to the power that is working in us. He says, I have told you how God has redeemed his people. I have prayed that you would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I know this is beyond comprehension. This is more than you can ever imagine. But I want you to understand something, saints of God. Although everything I have told you seems impossible, God is able. He can bring it to pass. God can accomplish it. And listen, God can perform it. And listen, if it's not there, He can create it. God is not idle. He is not inactive. He is not dead. He is working in your life right now. He will perform it. He will provide for you. He will sustain you. He will accomplish in you everything that he has ordained in your life. One door is open. Just keep looking. Or one door is closed. Just keep looking. Because another door is going to open. God will do immeasurably more than you and I could ever ask or imagine. Now let me just take you down that road for just a minute. If you think it, God can do it. And if you think that God has, has stopped right there, if you think God can do greater, then guess what? God can take you to that greater. Somebody need to grasp this. Not only, listen, he says more than you can think. Every time you think, God is always a step ahead of you. Somebody will get that on the way home. Because God is just that immeasurable. He is just that great. God is able to do more than we could ever ask. Oh, listen, and this is what I love. He 
from the dead. Listen, Abraham received the promise of God, but there is more. Moses had a glimpse of God in his blood and his head began to glow. But guess what? There is more. Elijah called down fire from heaven. But there is more. Enoch walked with God until he chased death no more. But there is more. Peter walked on the water. But there is more. Jesus fed the 5,000. But I come to tell the church, there is more. That same Jesus that God led and died on the cross, buried three days later, rose again, ascended into heaven. But guess what? There is more. If you don't get anything else, get this. The power of God that is able to do all of these things. And I want you to get it. I've said it, but I want to say it again. It is the same power that's already in you. It's the same power that's already in you. Paul says it's according to the power that is at work within us right now. You may not have realized it yet. We never will in this life. And I believe God has given us a foretaste of his glory and power. And he has placed it right on the inside of us. Listen, all you got to do is just allow God to work in you. And if you allow God to work in you, God is going to keep moving. And the more you allow Him to work in you, the more He's going to keep moving. The more He's going to bring out of you. The more God works in you. The more people around you are going to see the power of God working in you. They're going to come to you because they see the power of God working on the inside of you. I come today, the Metropolitan of the Thank God 
even happily for some things. Maybe not you, but maybe you want to intercede on the behalf of someone else. The altar is open, my brother, my sister. Won't you come? Won't you come? Maybe you got some decisions you have to make in the next few days. And some doctor's appointments that's come. Some things you've been praying about in the private and you seeking God's face. Labor, I see you. That's that's going to come. That's what it is. More prayer works. We're just not saying it has to be saying something prayer. Our ministry, because if y'all can just connect and then pray, we will pray. Just as the Lord needs you, just go and pray. Just pray. We trust you that we're blessed in the field. We trust you we're blessed going out. We 
continue to shine. Thank you, God, for us coming back metropolitan. Thank you for meeting us here in metropolitan this morning. God, we have only one thing left to do, and that's praise your name for what you're going to do. Just Lord, I'll give you praise for how you're going to do it. We just don't give you glory, God, for how you're going to make the way. So, Lord, this is our praise. This is our prayer. This has been our petition. In the name of Jesus, we ask it all. And those who are not ashamed this morning, won't you just give God your best praise? Come on, come on. Come on, give God your best praise.
hearts and then I'll come back and we'll do our family time. Gracious unto you. 